Justin Bonds. Welcome to Validated. Thank you. It's really uh, wonderful for you to invite me here today, and I'm uh, I'm excited to speak to you. Yeah, you know, this is an episode I uh, wasn't sure we'd ever do. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a surprise to me as well, but I think it's important that we're able to um, change our mind over time. So yes. um, I think I might as well just call out the elephant in the room while while we're here. Is uh, historically, I've been a very large um, Solana critic, and I think over the last um, few months, let's say, I've I've really warmed up to Solana in a in a number of different ways. Yeah, I want to I want to talk about that, but I also think you do a few things that are pretty rare for someone in this space to do. Um, the first is you change your mind. Uh, the second is that you articulate and take positions that I think most people who are on the capital side don't do. If you look at most of the theses coming out of large VCs or even like actively traded funds, they're very broad. They seem to never want to put their bet on a specific technology. They always want to talk about a category of technology or talk about a, a, a type of application that could potentially take off. Even when they're making really strong statements, you very rarely see them saying, this company is going to succeed, this protocol is going to succeed, this protocol is not going to succeed. So I, I kind of want to start a little bit with your background and how you sort of decided that that sort of sharp articulation of a specific thesis was something you wanted to be sort of putting out there in public. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And now I would love to talk about talk about that in more detail. Um, and I think I think part of the reason why is, is I'm not an an average investor in cryptocurrency. I think I think you see a lot of VCs out there. Um, you see a lot of traders, you see a lot of uh, quant quantitative approaches. Um, but I'm I'm very much taking a uh, value investing, long-term value investing approach into cryptocurrency. So as part of that is I'm, I'm really a, a blockchain researcher uh, first, really looking at the fundamentals and trying to understand the fundamentals. And as part of that, you know, really think about some of the big questions in the cryptocurrency space. And and I think if you're doing long-term value investing in cryptocurrency, like like my firm is doing, um, Cyber Capital, um, then it's, I think, a lot of thinking about cryptocurrency revolves around some of these big questions. Like, do we scale with monolithic or a modular approach? Do we do on-chain governance or do we do off-chain governance? Is it proof of work or should we do proof of stake? Should we have deterministic or non-deterministic block production, et cetera, et cetera? And I think there's these really big questions. And I think if you're able to answer these questions, then I think things become more self-evident um, down the mm -hmm. road. And and I think that's where, you know, you could say I take a very different approach to most other investors in the space. And I think that's also what leads me down, down a contrarian road as well. And that's something I've chosen to be very public about as well and calling out things that I disagree with um, a lot of the time and, and, and going out of my way to critique things when I, when I see problems with things and, uh, and taking a strong position. And, and sometimes I, I'm, I'm going to go against the um, grain or I'm going to go against what the majority think. And I think that's not an approach that most VCs in this space take. They, they tend to go with the majority. They tend to follow the waves. Whereas I think there is more opportunity, at least, at least for me as a long-term value investor, um, there's there's more opportunity in in seeking areas where the majority of people might be wrong. Yeah, so I want to dig into that a little more because I think when people say they're a long term investor in crypto, sometimes they mean you know nine to twelve months. Um, for you, what is that sort of perspective of of your long term vision? Like, how many years or or what time duration are you normally looking at and thinking about? And how do you sort of go about identifying and 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 codifying what those values are that you think will produce uh, returns over that time horizon? Oh wow, that's a that's a great question. There's actually there's actually a lot to unpack there. Obviously, yes. Um, so, um, so first of all, I'll, I think there's two questions. I think the first question would be um, um, how how long is your time horizon? The second question is how do you evaluate what is value, what is good fundamentals in the space? So. I'll start with uh, time horizon. So specifically to cyber capital and its its mandate and its its investment uh, philosophy and strategy. I think when we invest in a cryptocurrency, we invest with the mentality that we could still be holding this cryptocurrency in a century from now. Mm. 
So really thinking long term on terms of civilizational timescales, right? I mean, the reality though is that we might buy an asset with the intention of the long term, but the reality is that cryptocurrency keeps changing. Our um, you know, the competition keeps changing, the technology keeps evolving, and our understanding of the fundamentals keep changing as well. So based upon those changing fundamentals, we keep, you know, switching around positions. We, and quite dramatically, even really, um, you know, cyber capital is now the oldest cryptocurrency fund in Europe. I founded it in um, 2016. And, you know, in 2017, we were very public about not holding any BTC at all in the fund being you know, critical towards BTC in this case. And that was a lot more controversial back then than it is um, today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I think as part of that, um, we, we, we really try to switch the position. So for instance, uh, you know, one month there might not be a lot of movement at all, another month like 10% of the, the portfolio might have changed. It's funny because you look at like a something like a hundred year time horizon, and there's just so many assumptions. I mean, even on a ten year time horizon, the number of assumptions you have to make that goes into being confident over even ten years is 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 high. So I'm I'm curious because again, most folks in the space are not thinking about that long. Most folks, even in like the equities investment space, are not in that sort of time horizon. I, I, so, I should also clarify something here. I'm, I'm, I'm almost, sure. I think when we, in, as from a researcher's perspective, we have that mentality is like, could this still be something that exists in a hundred years from now? But I think from a investor's perspective, I should say, because we don't expect investors to wait a hundred years to see a return, sure, obviously. That would be one heck of an ARR. More, more like a three to five year horizon is what we recommend to our investors uh, as, still, as, as a minimum. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That, that's still a that's still a, a amount of time that is hard to predict in this in this space. So, I, I kind of and this gets into the sort of the values that you've identified for cyber capital in terms of what what you and it thinks in terms of um, what these what will make something successful within that that time horizon. But so I want I want to get into that. But then uh, also talk a little bit about that thesis development mm -hmm. out of those values. How you actually can say. Here's a series of values that we we believe in will make a something successful over the long term, and here's how we can see where a protocol is today and what how we extrapolate that out five years into the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and and you also touched on something you know interesting. I mean, this company's been running for um, close to seven years now. I've been a researcher in the space for um, uh, a decade now as well. And I think, but at least when you're working with a with a team of researchers and you're working in this kind of organized way and you're building up investment principles over time and you're building up a research database and you're you're developing all of these lessons, you know, and then you're developing your theories and your principles, then there is a lot of um, built up knowledge, um, so to speak, and 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 experience that you can draw on. So a lot of the time we might see a particular idea might come across our desk and we're like, oh, well, we already saw this in 2018 and that and that didn't work out very well. Or like, right. oh, well, we've explored, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas that people think are new, you know, have have potentially have already been tried in the past as well. And I think I think people underestimate um, the breadth of experience, I think, that we have in cryptocurrency as a whole already and, and in terms of that history. It always frustrates me when history repeats, but I suppose that's part of the tragedy of humanity as well on so many levels. I, I'm curious on that because in some ways, yes, absolutely. Like I think in the last bull market run up, you saw a lot of people who were around in 2018 sort of saying, I mean, you guys really should take some profits because like this isn't us. And then there are other people who were like, yes, we're up 12,000% on our meme token in the last 12 months, but don't worry, we're going to 24,000%. And you saw that dichotomy really strongly. But I, I think one of the pieces that was interesting to see is in the sort of like the market we're in now, which is not really a bear market in anything but price, right? Developer activity is still really high. User activity is still high. Um, there, there's ideas now that are buildable and that folks are building and have gotten adoption that couldn't be built a few years ago or at least couldn't catch on a few years ago. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious that this is, I mean, to take a step back for a second, I think the, the, the macro scope of what we're talking about today is how you bring new information into an existing thesis and be willing to rewrite that existing thesis. And 
I would say one component of that is that there's a lot of stuff that didn't work in 2020 into 2021 that is like starting to work in 2023. And that if, you know, you were talking about sort of we have this huge breadth of experience from the last 10 years and that's completely true. But, you know, I think payments are probably finally at a place where the technology is is sufficiently built up enough that it actually works, that USDC is dependable enough you can build a payments product. Well, in, in that example, I think it's very important to identify why a particular yeah. use case didn't work. So, you know, I've I've been beyond frustrated um, in terms of, you know, cryptocurrency history so far. We, we've had BTC, which was always intended to scale and pivot and didn't scale. And, you know, I was I was very vocal part of those block size debates, which which at least makes me very consistent to this day in my criticisms towards BTC. And then we had Ethereum, which was, you know, for many years committed to scaling on chain with sharding. And, you know, really as of last year, completely pivoted away from, you know, scaling on chain and um, focusing on a layer two, quote unquote, layer two uh, scalability roadmap. And and to me, that was really one of the um one of the biggest tragedies for me and and yeah. but i think i think as part of that it's very important to identify why i've i've never given up on this idea of payments i've i've always rejected this idea that oh 99% of use cases won't work because there's no capacity i mean i think i think just a, a blockchain that that doesn't have capacity is just just a bit of a joke to me you know it's like what are we even doing here what's even the point and I can understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I would like to loop back a little bit as well to your last question about evaluation. I think we're touching on it now as well in terms of how, how do we evaluate a cryptocurrency and, or at least how do, I, how do we do that or how do I do that? And I think, I think for me as a value investor, I've got a very large focus on utility. So I really think that there's an immense value in the utility that blockchains are able to bring to the table. You know, and and that can be, and that value is expressed in a different ways. I mean, we have these 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 tokens that are you know critical in terms of the functioning of the blockchain, and uh, you know, one characteristic that Solana shares with Ethereum as well is its economic model, in terms of having tail inflation combined with fee burning. This is one of the reasons yeah. I also actually really like Solana now, if I if I look at it objectively, and and there's a few more, um, which maybe we can touch on later. But so for me, in terms of evaluation, I look at things like um, what is the capacity of the blockchain? What is the, uh, you know, governance of a blockchain? What are the, what is the consensus algorithm, right? What is the internal state of the politics? I think it's very important to mm. take a holistic view here. What is the, you know, what security trade-offs are possibly being made here? So I think for me, it's taking this holistic view, even multidisciplinary approach, where you might combine things like computer science, um, economics, uh, political philosophy, uh, among other things, uh, to really understand the bigger picture of a cryptocurrency. Because you can't just look at a cryptocurrency from like a one-dimensional perspective. You can't just say, oh, it's good or it's bad because of this reason or that reason. It, there's, there's a huge scale of different parameters to, to consider. And I think at least for me as an investor and as a, as a believer in cryptocurrency, I think decentralization is of the utmost importance. Scalability is of the utmost importance. That's why I'm also of the belief that the blockchain Trilemma can be solved, or I, I would even argue it already has been solved, actually. Um, and and I, think, I think that's really what has been you know, defining my journey in so many ways, is that I want this empowering, freedom-enabling technology to be usable by everyone. That's that's where it really shines, you know? And, yeah. and and that's 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 been part of our focus as both as an investor, but also as a believer in this movement. You know, I, I found a place where I can happily combine those things. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about um, something you said there, which is organizational politics. Uh, I think a lot of times people look at blockchains and they just do a technical audit, they do a network audit, they you know look at how many on-chain transactions there are, and they really don't think about that, that human side. And I think they, implicitly there is an assumption in a lot of people that humans are messy, but it'll sort itself out. Uh, what do you view as both good and, and potentially not good signs when you're evaluating the, the more messy human side of an organization? Mm, yeah. 
So governance is uh, one of one of my specialities, you could say, in in cryptocurrency. Um, and and there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there, really. Um, so I, I've been a big advocate of on chain governance for many years. For, for many years, but I think maybe maybe it might sense to just just wind back a little bit and and, and mm-hmm. to, to understand where I'm coming from. So part of the reason I even started, you know, speaking up and switched from a lurker to a participant, let's say, in cryptocurrency, is because of what happened in BTC, where BTC mm-hmm. was you know, pivoting from one side to another. So back in the early days in 2014, I was on Bitcoin Talk and and I saw all of these, um, let's say, computer scientists and developers discussing the question of who decides. Like, how do we even decide, you know, whether to take path A or path B? And that's when I really felt, hey, I can actually contribute to this discussion because that was my background. I have a background in the humanities, personally, so political philosophy and history, among other things. So so for me, I was like, okay, well, this is great because now I can start thinking about, you know, human, I can start factor, factoring in human nature. And part of the reason why I even believe in cryptocurrency in the first place is that blockchains are uniquely able um, through, let's say, um, cryptographic economic game theory. They're, u- they're uniquely able to align incentives of human beings. And one of the things that initially really attracted me to cryptocurrency is that I saw a potential, a power um, for us to actually have new political experiments, uh, new new ways for uh, social coordination, uh, an, an, a new way to kind of have, a, have this kind of single single sources of truth, right? Um, that, that doesn't just rely, like, unlike, let's say, a lot of democracies. And I think a lot of the dysfunctions we see in democracies are due to, say, a populace that isn't as participatory or well-informed or enlightened or have good ethics than maybe we would ideally want them to be for the democracy to function in, in the most optimum way. Cryptocurrency doesn't depend on people's goodwill. It depends upon, like I said, economic incentives. And that's something that I realized that if we can modify human behavior in such a way uh, through economic incentives, then that is actually, that's unbelievably powerful. That's, that's actually a type of um, evolution of, say, the division of powers, if you will, in terms of, uh, or, or the separation of, uh, you know, certain aspects that were once part of the state can now be privatized. I mean, this is, this is, I saw this as being this really big deal in terms of um, civilizational progress. And I think the challenge, and I think governance, I genuinely believe this, I think governance is probably one of the biggest unsolved problems in cryptocurrency yet. I think part of the challenge, and we're facing, facing dilemmas here, is that, you know, what I saw happen in, in BTC in terms of this quote-unquote off-chain governance or what, what they call social consensus is that effectively you have a centralized group of developers um, that end up deciding on the course yeah. of what a cryptocurrency is going to do. I can get you can get ten people in a room together. I, I would argue ten to twenty people in both BTC, Ethereum, and I would say Solana as well. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing at its stage, but it's something we need to acknowledge. You know, you get those people together, you get them all to agree to a particular course of action, right? And then you come out together with that course of action and that's what's going to happen. Like that's yeah. like the real politic behind the scenes. So, I mean, that's why, you know, also, also as an investor, also as a researcher, like we're very dependent upon the core team doing the right thing. So I would argue that even if you implemented on-chain governance, even if you added proposal voting, this would still happen. I don't actually think decentralized governance even functions unless you're at a much larger scale. And, you know, this is kind of the dilemma. It's a chicken for the egg problem, right? But however, if you implement the decentralized governance too late, the system might already be captured to a point where, um, hmm. to a to a point where you can't actually implement it. So for instance, if the system's at a very large scale and you have this balance of power and you have these people kind of all, and or, or say the system's captured and you have someone that's already effectively controlling the system. If you're saying, okay, we're now going to implement decentralized govern- governance, you're basically asking them to give up their power, right? That that goes against their human incentives, so to speak. So governance to me is really about 
you know, considering the corruptibility of human beings, considering that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, it's about mitigating those those negative effects so that we can have a system that optimizes also for good decision making instead of relying on the leadership. But this thing only functions at a massive scale that we haven't even mm -hmm. reached yet. And that's why we're so dependent upon teams initially. So, sorry, I, I, that was a bit of a rant. And no, I've no, got a I, few things for you to maybe comment on there. So, I, I, I've been laughing this whole time because, um, like, my my background is government and political science. Oh, and we have that studies. in common then. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. And, and all of my kind of undergraduate work, and I actually thought about, like, going and working and on a PhD or coming out of school on this was on treaty compliance frameworks and international freshwater management treaties. Um, because that's that's exactly what we're talking about here. It's a finite, scarce resource that no one has a complete monopoly on, but you have to build governance frameworks that two countries that hate each other, potentially, uh, or at least two governments that hate each other, like India and Pakistan, have fought several wars but never turned the water off to one another. And like that is a massive success of treaty frameworks. Mm. And I think there's so much of political science that can come into this blockchain space and, and really help us make things that are both more compelling and, and more usable for folks. But at its core, like the thing that brought me into this space was the idea that if we get the philosophy of self-governance and self-custody into more people's minds, as opposed to the idea of government being something that happens to you, as opposed to something that you have influence on, uh, we can fix a lot of the problems in the world today. Uh, but there's too many folks who just sort of say, well, we'll, we'll let the government fix it. And at some point, you have to be the government in order to fix things that are large enough. They require lots of buy-in. So uh, it, it's kind of funny that we have that, that similar background there. Yeah, no, certainly. And it's we're actually uh, part of a rare breed in cryptocurrency. I think usually people have the yeah. more te technical background. Uh, so it's like you can you can get a you can get a computer scientist to learn political philosophy, or you can get a political philosopher to use computer science. It's, it's a toss up. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because like this is the thing like I talk about all the time with um with folks is that I think the hardest problems for blockchains over the next ten years is not going to be technical. It's going to be social. Yeah. That the the technical side right now it used to be computer science and now it's just software engineering, which is not to belittle software engineering, but it's just work. Like we fundamentally know what we're trying to do, how we build it matters, but how we build it is like the human side of it. Mm. Building it's actually just work at this point. Mm. Well, I mean, it depends what you're building towards, right? So part of the reasons I've become more um, uh, bullish on Solana is actually due to Ethereum's failures to scale on, on, on so many ways. And it's like, well, why, why did it give up on sharding? You know, why are they saying it's not possible? Yeah. Um, and while other blockchains are scaling, right? Like that's, that's the most damning thing to me. Like for them to say it's not possible to scale and then competitive blockchains are scaling. And, you know, that that to me, you know, while preserving decentralization, I might add, um, you know, that to me is very damning. Like that to me is, okay, I actually think there is a, um, and, and I actually think it's the same thing. This, this L2 scaling narrative, mm -hmm. I think it's to a large part because of, you know, a disproportional amount of funding that exists for layer twos as opposed to layer one development. So from a developer's perspective, mm. there's a lot more money to be made. Like we're talking about billions of dollars in these tokens in, in, in VC investments and in companies that are being spun off. I mean, be it Arbitrum and Optimism and these things in Ethereum or be it Blockstream and Chain Code Labs and BTC. Like yeah. I, actually, I actually think this mm. is a major conflict of interest. And I think if you say, well, developers are totally in charge of this system and it's effectively a type of quasi-dictatorship, if you will, uh, which I think is completely undefendable uh, when it comes to an, you know, a de what's supposed to be a decentralized blockchain, um, you know, I think that's a major perverse incentive. And I, I've seen this happening twice now, happen in Bitcoin, happen in Ethereum. So I'm like, okay, this is a systemic flaw in governance. Mm. And BTC and, and Ethereum has been very vocal on, they're against on-chain governance. They're all for off-chain governance. So what does off-chain governance mean? Like, like what does that mean? Like, right. who, who actually gets to decide in, in an off-chain governance system? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, it's basically old-school politics, but without any of the checks and balances. 
without any mm. transparency, without without any accountability. It's it's just it's just Lord of the Flies. Okay? Okay? If you know anything about political philosophy or political science or history, yes. you know that that's a very, very bad idea. That's just throwing the sheep to the wolves. Like Yeah, it it's funny, like in a world in a weird way, we are talking about regulatory capture here. Yeah. Like that 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 some amount of core contributor uh Was this like technically it's corporate capture, maybe? Um yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah. Right. That like the incentives of the people who are actually now building most of the code has divorced from the interests of the people actually using the network and the original founding ideals of what a network is. Exactly. So so here's my question. Do you think any network can actually survive this? I think blockchains are very good at surviving. So mm -hmm. if I were just to nitpick a little bit, I would say uh, sure. there's a big difference between surviving, thriving, or even keeping dominance. So no, I think I think ultimately no blockchain will thrive or or keep any sort of dominance if the system becomes captured like this, especially in a very perverse way that effectively cripples the blockchain. You know, I, I'd like to point that out because I'm I'm very yeah. unconvinced that a quote unquote layer two scaling ecosystem is able to provide a good enough UX. Um, mm. and, and, you know, yeah. for that reason, yeah, I would say that, no, uh, that's why I think that if Ethereum continues on its current path, I'm convinced we'll lose its dominance. And, you know, BTC is clearly way overdue for losing its number one position in this market. It's becoming a bit embarrassing at this point, frankly speaking, but we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like back in, in 2020, I was working at Bison Trails and one of our major initiatives there was building ETH2 staking infrastructure. And that included a whole educational component of it of it too. And you know, I remember sitting down and going through this stuff. This is when we were still talking about sharding, right? There was supposed to be 56 shards that were going to launch based on the beacon chain. And then, you know, from there it would scale up to hundreds, if not thousands of shards someday. And I love yeah, that. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's what I signed up for. I'm like on chain scaling. Yeah, I'm a BT. I'm a BTC refugee. This is great. The new promise. Right, land. and then there were going to be data availability shards, and then that fell off. Uh -huh. Like the execution fell off, and then the data shards actually fell off as well. And I, I guess I'm kind of curious from well, well, from the perspective... sharding is a form of da da data sharding, right? Data availability sharding, technically. Yeah, that's that's true, but yeah. it still seems very limited in terms of how much data we're actually adding. Right. At least to me. And and it's very it's unbelievably reminiscent again. I'm I'm gonna keep repeating this theme of uh, history repeating itself. But what they're doing with data availability data availability uh, sorry, data availability sharding, right? Is they're they're doing something that pretty much only benefits layer twos. Right? So they're yeah. creating this kind of separate field where now uh, layer twos can put their data in cheaper, right? But this sharding does not cover execution. So no layer one transactions, no layer one smart contract uh, logic or anything like that. No, it's just data availability for... And the thing is, the amount of gas that the layer twos are spending is around 1% of the total net network, right? Mm -hmm. So all that they're doing is they're, they're, they're not relieving the network as a whole. They're just giving the layer two is this kind of advantage saying, oh, well, now you have this separate field where you can put the data in that that you need, right? Reminds me a lot of SigWit, by the way. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this history, but in SigWit, they created a separate field which literally had an arbitrary 50% discount which would specifically benefit the Lightning Network, right? In, and they did yeah. this instead of just increasing the block size limit. So, I mean, this just strikes me as being kind of exactly the same thing. So, you know... Ethereum is not scaling at all, basically. That that one percent of relief is pretty much negligible at this point. And I might add the amount of fees that layer twos are uh, collecting. So so a as you know, for for a while there, Ethereum was deflationary because of the fee burning, which is great. And I think for the last month or two months, if I know quickly, it has not been deflationary. It's actually been increasing in its total supply. Well, if Ethereum had simply scaled. And let's say all of the transaction in the layer twos were now on the layer one, Ethereum would be deflationary again. So yes. and, and, and and only one percent of the total gas fees are actually going back to Ethereum. These layer twos are quasi-parasitical on the chain at this point. 
like you know, to, don't get me wrong I, I i don't think all layer twos are bad i think there's use cases where layer twos make sense but restricting the layer one in favor of layer twos that's that's a travesty in in my opinion yeah and it's always i've always found it interesting that the folks who are like true believers in L2s and, you know, like say what you will about like the folks who are true believers, but like there are some very smart technical people who really believe in the L2 architecture. They will tell you that L2s are Ethereum, that this is the natural scaling future of Ethereum. And the piece that's always been interesting for me is, well, then why, why are more people not comfortable transacting on them? And that's always been that sort of lock for me is like if you were creating a true L2 architecture that felt the same to folks emotionally as transacting on Ethereum, that would be a different effect. But the fact that people are even still bothering to transact on Ethereum today means the L2 vision, at least in my view, uh, is still nowhere near fruition, whether you believe in it or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like we don't have the L2 implementation today that we were promised by the L2 folks. Yeah. And I, and I think it's actually unsolvable. And, and, I'll, and I'll get into that a little bit. It's so I think a true scaling solution should be part of a coherent whole, so to speak. So that from a user's perspective, you don't need to know about layer twos or shards or parallelization or separate, you know, mempools in the case of Solana. Um, and I think that layer twos fundamentally can't solve that because what they're essentially doing is they're saying, okay, we're going to let the free market Instead of L1 developers doing L1 development, they're going to say, no, the free market is going to solve this for us. And, you know, the free market is great. I love the free market. I'm a, I'm a capitalist. But yeah. not all things should be solved by the free market. I think something that Ethereum did right was unleashing smart contracts. So smart, just make a Turing complete and specific dApps can be built out. Unleash that to the free market. I thought that was a great idea. That's, I think, one of the main reasons Ethereum was successful. And... Bitcoin not scaling. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think that that in, in the case of attempting to solve it that way, what you end up with is massive fragmentation. So then you'll have yes. hundreds of solutions, right? And some of those solutions are going to have admin keys. And some of those solutions are going to be custodian. And some of those solutions are going to have centralized sequences, okay? And in order for a user to have to navigate that now is just way too much to ask, right? Because yeah. it requires so much more user choice. Like these Ethereum L2 folks will say, oh, no, 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 we'll solve the UX options. We'll just abstract it all away. No, but you can't. Because if you abstract it away, you take away user choice to a point that it would be wrong, right? Let's say we have an ecosystem of 100 L2s. You can't make it seamlessly interoperable because you can't say have a purely decentralized, proper cypherpunk L2 seamlessly interoperate without any user input with some with a chain that maybe has admin keys or has to go right. through a trusted bridge. All of these things present extra risks and a user needs to be informed of those risks. So so to me, I don't see how this kind of quote unquote free market of of layer twos will ever solve the problem. If you enshrined the layer twos or did like based L twos where the L1 validators actually um confirm you know, are actually responsible for those rollups. Then you could have an ecosystem of, en of enshrined rollups where it would be perfectly in uh, seamless and interoperable. I'm actually open to that potential solution for scaling, but that's not what Ethereum is doing. And I think even if yeah. it decides to do that in the future, the power of these layer twos, the, uh, you know, the amount of income they're making, it's going to be too entrenched. It's going to be too much to politically overcome. You know, I mean, I mean, in theory, we can change the code of any blockchain. Right, we can fork any ledger, but what right. we need to evaluate is what's the probability of change in this direction. What are the incentives one way, and what are the incentives the other way? This is part of like how to do a real political analysis, right? To actually predict what decisions are going to be made. And I think I don't see how Ethereum is going to get out of this one. I mean, I'm trying to best to shout off the rooftop, say hey, this is a terrible idea, but I'm I'm really struggling to see how. Um, how this can be solved without, you know, just voting with our feet. Yeah, it's it's so funny that like this whole conversation, I'm, I'm I'm laughing this whole time because it's like there's so few people who are really thinking about this stuff this way. And this is like, like I remember when Greenpeace came out with that whole change the code campaign uh, for Bitcoin, 
right? What, what, what are you thinking about the change? There are so many folks who are like, it's Bitcoin, you can't change the code. I'm like, of course you can change the code. It's all social consensus. There's no Bitcoin corporation that's stamping a, you know, this is Bitcoin, this is not. Like if everyone running nodes decides like, hey, we're going to change something, like it's changed. Well, that's it. Fair, that's how it goes. I think, I think Bitcoin Core needs to give it a stamp of approval or sure. no change will happen. I mean, that's part of my critique of BTC is that it's effectively you have a single party that can act as gatekeeper to all decision making. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, and, but still, and hold on, hold on. The changeable. majority of nodes decide on governance. I mean, that is such I a know, ridiculous right? idea. No, no. I mean, yeah. it's like, I mean, proof of work was invented as a civil prevention mechanism, right? Yes. It literally says in the white paper by Satoshi, you can't base consensus on, you know, one IP, one vote. It doesn't work. Yeah. It right? doesn't work. <laughs> this is just, you can spin up thousands of nodes trivially. So this idea of like, oh no, it's like, you know, this is, this is, this is, it. it's this fantasy of like, no, this is this perfect meritocracy. It's this perfect egalitarian utopia where the best ideas always win and we're all open-minded and we all sing Kumbaya and, and, and Bitcoin just represents perfect decentralization. It's, it's a delusion. That's not how things work. Yeah, completely. And this reminds me of the, um, you know, the Ronin Bridge hack where there was that guy that shorted Axie when he noticed all the ETH was gone. Uh, and no one believed him for four days till they bothered to check. And that's just like, these markets are perfect information. They have all the information. It's literally all on chain. And we still couldn't even be bothered to look and see if the ETH was still in the bridge or not. Yeah. Like, this is the thing that always, like, the paradox of this space for me is that we've never had more open and more perfect information systems. And somehow it seems like we've never been worse informed about what's actually going on on them. Well, that's, that's where human beings are the, the floor in the system, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's where we need to hammer out better kind of designs of governance to kind of mitigate that and to formulate that, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a wild, uh, it's a wild ride, but I think it's part of that I'm, um, I'm thankful just to be part of this, this time period, you know? and to yeah. be able to put my weight on the scales a little bit in terms of one way or another. I think I think Solana has, as, as they, they don't have decentralized governance, but there has been a talk about it, and they're not against it, as far as I understand. Yeah, our, um, so the governance model on Solana right now is basically validator stake-weighted upgrades. So the validators effectively vote on upgrades by activating, oh, really? by a adopting new software that includes feature activation. So... For example, if there were, we're going to increment something from, you know, by 0.1 to another version, mm. um, the, that code for like a new version of like an on-chain program or something like that would be included in the software update package that goes out, oh, wow. which you say was like a core piece of SPL code. Wow. And then, you know, once 80% of the network adopts that software version, then the feature sort of is activated at the next epoch boundary. But if, if the folks running validators just decide, nope, we don't like that change. We're not going to upgrade the software. Uh, there's no way to force that through. But it's not running through like a DAO-based governance. It is uh, validator stake-weighted governance. Cool. Right no, now. no, that's that's a very good start. And that's that's one of the starting principles for me. It needs to be stakeholder-based. So that, yeah. that you already have that um, enshrined in the culture or in the social contract, I think, is, is a very powerful thing. And I might also add, one of the things that, you know, I don't think many people realize the significance of this, but one of the things that also makes Solana more attractive to me and, and part of the reason why my view has changed is you also have mm. multiple client implementations on Solana. Yes. And and I, I just think that's so crucial for any type of, you know, any type of real decentralization. Because if you only have one client implementation, it's, it's effectively a one-party system. Like, you know, yeah, you only have one yes. party that's actually competent at, at making changes, then, yeah, there's no choice. I mean, validators can vote, but they're voting for the one party. It doesn't make sense, right? Exactly. So, so in that sense that now you have, I believe it's called Fire Dancer, right? And there's, yes. there's some others maybe in the works as well. But th that I find very, that's one of the areas where I felt like BTC was very weak. And actually Ethereum mm -hmm. has that as well. Ethereum actually has multiple clients implementations as well to its credit. It's one of the things that yes. really did right, um, along with totally smart contracts, along with its economic model. Just want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a lot of shade to Ethereum, but it's, it's worthwhile pointing out the things it's got right. Um, people find it difficult, right, to kind of criticize something and then also praise it. Uh, I, I don't know. I found people, it's way too tribal sometimes to kind of 
to be able to do that. It's like, it's either all good or it's all bad. I find that a bit yeah. frustrating sometimes. I, maybe I spend too much time on Twitter. I, no, I, I think that is a lot of the, the, the worst parts about this space are sort of the idea that in order for my protocol to succeed, yours must fail, yeah. right? And that is like just so unhealthy because there's at most 30 million daily active users of blockchain. Like the the TAM is so huge. Like we don't need to be worried about like the ordinal rankings in the top 10 chart, at least in my opinion. Yeah, no, no, certainly. And uh, yeah. yeah, no, and I'm excited to see where um, Solana is going to go in terms of future uh, governance mechanisms. I'm a big fan of uh, self-funding mechanisms where you take mm-hmm. part of the block award, uh, put that towards a treasury. Because that, that perverse incentive that I mentioned before, I think uh, self-funding mechanisms provide a L1 bias source of funding which can actually counteract the corruption of, say, external funding sources. And it, it potentially mm. makes it blockchain more competitive. And I, I will acknowledge there's a lot of waste in such a system, inefficiency in such a system yes. as well. But I think I think that trade-off is, is highly worth it. Um, longer lock-in periods to you know prioritize uh, long-term decision-making over short-term decision-making or you know, some sort of curve, at least, where the longer you lock it in. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do in terms of the governance design to uh, you know, improve improve those outcomes, and that's yeah. that's an area that I have a lot of interest in. And yeah, and and considering what's been happening in cryptocurrency, considering how the, some of the turns and pivots and twists have been pretty disappointing when it comes to Ethereum for me, that's why I've started to see like, oh, okay, so I'm this big monolithic scaling advocate. Um, and I really don't like this L2 scaling roadmap. And 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 I will also add, actually, I wanted to mention this because in my early critiques of Solana, I actually yeah. critiqued the lack of fee markets and attributed that to some of the instability. And uh, I'll add the Solana community is very graceful. There's a few people calling me out saying, I don't know what I'm talking about, but that's that's pretty par the course <laughs> that's one thing about a completely voluntary system you can't control who joins um yes but i think that's most of my technical critiques from back then have actually been uh, addressed you have fee markets now um and and so it fixed most of these technical critiques and to me that was very like a big deal you know combine that with yeah. the economic model combine that with you know some basic on-chain governance Combine that with multiple client implementations, and really that Solana has, you know, I was, I'm going to be honest with you, I was kind of expecting the whole typical VC kind of pump and dump pattern <laughs> where, where you know, like, uh, you know, it's kind of, you have this hype cycle, and then, you know, predatory VCs kind of just dump and give up on the thing and then move on to the next thing, and then the hype cycle continues. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen that so much in cryptocurrency, right? And that was somewhat, I have to admit, somewhat my expectation of Solana. But then we kind of reached this point where it's like, hey, wait a second, the ecosystem's still being built up. It still has this kind of prominent mindshare, like past that kind of um, the, the the normal kind of cycle there. And that's where I was like, and then, and then today where it's really gained a lot of, um, how do I put this? Kind of, kind of traction and become very representative of, you know, a symbol of monolithic scaling, even you will. It's like, okay, this is now a natural ally to me. If I, if I look at it objectively and all these different factors, then yeah, I, I have to change my mind, you know, and, and I'm happy that I did. I'm, I'm always happy in these cases, at least when I change my mind for the better. I'm always yeah. sad when I have to change my mind for the worse, but <laughs> yeah. So I actually want to go back to that and not to sort of relitigate the early days and mm-hmm. sort of go point by point with you on that because that's not good use of anyone's time. But when you first looked at Solana, what did you see that sort of gave you pause and that sort of gave you that conviction to put out, you know, some messaging in the in the early days and, you know, as as recent as sort of, you know, a year ago, talking about how you thought the Solana philosophy was wrong like what were the things that you as a researcher were looking at in the early days i mean like these these are red flags for me these give me concerns and then i you know we'll we'll get into Mm -hmm. the the follow-up too of like how that act how your position actually changed on that you know as as the years went on but like walk me through Mm -hmm. what that sort of initial research was like to the point where you felt it was worth publicly stating something like that yeah yeah and um no i i do a lot of public critiques of, of a lot of different cryptocurrencies i wasn't i was wasn't just focused on uh on solano obviously 
Um, but yeah, I think I think for me, Solana takes a very extreme approach, you could say, to the uh, dilemma. I mean, they are throwing, hmm. they have very high node requirements, let's say. So to me, I felt like that was, you know, there's trade-offs to be made in terms of scalability and, and decentralization. And I felt like, like Solana was going too far into um into those trade-offs. I felt like that that was it was making it too centralized, let's say. It was making it too risky, right? Yeah. And I think there was a time period, I think over like a year or two years, like the network went down like twelve times or something like that. I've lost I don't know, the last time I counted at least. I don't know, it's debatable. Some people say eight, but I, I don't know. More than was acceptable. Right. I, I think we can all agree on I that. don't think a blockchain should go down at all honestly. Um, and other blockchains have shown that, you know, that can be done. So I felt like, I felt like, but to its credit, it hasn't gone down now for how long has it been? Like six months or something like that? Or I don't remember exactly. February. Oh, is that, is that when? Right. So it's, it's been a while at least. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty yeah. pleased with that. Um, so to me, I felt like, okay, they're, when they're making these trade-offs, right? And also I had a critique of a lack of fee markets. I was always of the belief that fee markets are actually critical, even in a highly scalable blockchain yes. to to regulate and to like prevent, you know, certain types of attacks or uh, problems, right? So it was that, it was that also combined with the uh, non-deterministic block production. That was also an issue for, for me somewhat. And I believe that's still the case, but the balance of um, the evaluation has changed. Yeah. What part of it? Uh, sorry, let's. I'm, I'm. I'm curious what you like. What part of the non-deterministic block production? Because Solana's got a strange architecture where transactions have to say, "Here are all of the accounts, and here's all the state I want to talk to before it executes." And so, we often refer to that as deterministic transactions, whereas Ethereum transactions are non-deterministic. Oh, um, yeah, which is actually, part I, of why I, I you can only up. do one thing at a time. I, I mean to yeah. say deterministic, sorry. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. got it. Um, yeah, no, I, I didn't check all my notes before this, but... No, no, you're good. It was, it was the fact that you're able to predict the next validator. That's what I mean with deterministic ah, the, the, the leader schedule yeah. is determined ahead of time. Yeah, and I felt there's yes. a trade-off to be made there because that potentially allows you to specifically target the next validators in line uh, with potential DDoS attacks. And then you might be, it might be easier to reach a 51% threshold potentially as well using using that type of attack. So that's something I was critical of in terms of the grand scheme of things. Yep. And that, that in particular um, was partic even particularly more problematic without fee markets because then you could, mm. could also crash things a bit more and et cetera. So, so yeah, so for me, it was really in the grand yeah. scheme of things. And I, I, I still think I like, I still think sharding, if I'm being completely honest, I still think sharding is a better approach, um, in, in all, but actually I also see a future where potentially Solana might be sharded in the future as well. Um, and I've seen some clients even do it, not on the consensus layer, but, um, and I think that's also very interesting. I think parallelization actually lends itself very well to that approach. But I think I think what what made me change my mind. So those those are some of the things I was critical towards. I think what made me change my mind is that like nothing is perfect. And if I'm evaluating all these different factors, like okay, sure, I like sharding more, okay, mm -hmm. and I like non-deterministic block production more. Like all those things are still true. I like fee markets. It did fix that. Right, I like multiple clients implementations. It fix that. I like, I like its economic model. Solana also has that, right? So, in the if I'm balancing, like I'm like saying, nothing is perfect, you know. And I'm invested in over thirty different cryptocurrencies, right? Nothing is perfect. So for me, to me, like it's also like the best technologies don't always win, or what I think are the best technologies won't always win, you know. And and also community matters, and also like like a, a, a certain um, critical mass of DeFi activity matters a lot, right? And, yeah. I, and I felt like Solana gained that. And, 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 and what succeeds in markets is more than just about what I think is the quote unquote perfect design. Something, sometimes something is just good enough, all right? And, um, and I think Solana is that. And sure, I still think sharding is technically a better approach. But Solana is still able to achieve a very high TPS. And I also still believe in Moore's law, 
So I'll mm. I'll agree on that too. Yep. Um, you know, whether whether a sharded blockchain will become more dominant or whether Solana becomes more dominant, I'm 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 okay with either scenario. I'm okay creating win-win scenarios where it's not a take-all market either. And right. so in that sense, you know, I'm like, I'm reflecting and, you know, part of what I do internally as a researcher is we got, we got price target models where we have over a hundred different parameters that we evaluate in order to see, okay, where, what kind of point score does this give us relative to its current market capitalization, right? This is part of value, the value investing that I do. I'm like, okay. Solana scoring actually pretty high here. I have to be objective. I have to like bite my tongue after, after writing these extensive critiques and saying that, you know, Solana is terrible, that you know what? Solana is actually pretty good and, uh, and face, face the backlash for that and, and have some damn intellectual honesty. Okay. And I think, I think that's, it's, I, I'm struggling a bit, as you can see, to, to, to explain my change of mind, but that's, I think that's t that's it to a large part. No, and and I look, I appreciate you going through this. I know it's it's never easy to sort of say, "Hey, here was something I was vocal about, and and here is a new opinion I have that's not congruous with that original one." Yeah, I think this is something that is uh, deeply lacking in the blockchain industry in general is a, is a willingness of people to admit um, when they've changed their mind let alone to sort of come out and say publicly, hey, for the record, I have changed my mind. It doesn't mean I won't change it back again, but here's my current thinking. Yep. How did you sort of get personally comfortable with that idea that you were going to both articulate a very strong position and then potentially, you know, a few months later, articulate a very different position on the same topic? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think for me, I think my philosophy background, I find incredibly yeah. helpful for me. So I think what, what, like being able to reason and and understanding you know rationality these these type of things it's it's you know and i've always been a big believer in um in in socrates living an examined life right to yeah. always question your own beliefs and always you know try to you know eliminate that bias there's, there's what i want to believe and there's truth right uh, based on my rationality. There's my emotional self. My emotional self might believe one thing, but then if I'm being objective and I'm actually applying, you know, my my reasoning and, and my ability to argue and my ability to reason, then then I think that's what's really helped me. And that's, you know, it's part of the enlightenment. It's part of, you know, the the, the gift of philosophy that we have as part of our civilization. And I think I really believe in that. I really believe in, in pursuing truth and having intellectual honesty and um, being able to change my mind. I think that's so important because if you can't change your mind and, and approach things with humility, you can never really learn. You're well, very limited, at least, in your ability to learn and your ability to evolve. So I've I've really put that I mean, in terms of my own ethos, I've put that front and center in terms of how I think about cryptocurrency and how I approach everything in life, really, um, well, most things at least in life, is I approach it with a very, um, you know, self-examined perspective. And and I think we need a lot more in that in cryptocurrency. People get very emotional and, and tribal and they get tunnel vision and, and they can't they can't see the forest and the trees. And I think yeah. I think the ability to understand, you know, logical contradictions and fallacies and create argument trees and all of these type of things are incredibly powerful tools for clear thinking. I think I think in the modern world, I think people are a lot of people, and I think you you'd probably appreciate this as well. A lot of well, I mean, so so you refer to uh, political science. I think there is there is certainly a lot of science in political thought, but there's very large segments of political thought that are certainly not a science because they yeah. come down to subjective value judgments. And I think, I, think, I think a lot of people in the modern world think that science can answer all of our questions, but it can't. You know, science is an offshoot of philosophy. And there's things like there's things that science can answer. Science can answer things about the material world and, and what the reality is of our material world. Right. Philosophy can answer things about, you know, right or wrong or, um, you know, concepts, ideas, ideas that don't just exist in the in our world, ideas that exist in our mind. 
So what is a good idea? What is a sound idea? What is what is an idea without contradiction? Can you make a pot? An idea is like a pot that doesn't leak. You know, if you can't if you can't poke holes in it, if you can't if you can't contradict it, if you can't find any fallacy, then it's a good idea. And I think I think that's not in the realm of science, that's in the realm of philosophy. So I think understanding that distinction is important and and that's part of what I do in cryptocurrency as a critic is I is I try to think rationally about these things and and that's how I'm able to go against Ethereum. It's how like, you know, I I I I started in this world in 2013, like as a passionate Bitcoiner. You know? Yeah. And I was able to like evolve from going away from Bitcoin and and supporting Bitcoin Cash actually. And I'm and I'm proud of that, even though I think there's a lot of misinformation around the history around that. I think maybe that's a bit beyond this this podcast to get into that. But and then, you know, leaving Bitcoin, leaving Bitcoin Cash, going into Ethereum, now becoming more critical of Ethereum and being more supportive of, of alternative layer ones. And I'm going to keep changing my mind. And you know, some people are might point that out as a weakness, but I think that's a strength. And that's that's because I'm really putting that front and center. And uh, yeah, I really hope that if anyone calls me out for a contradiction or, or a mistruth, that I'm always able to um, correct myself, that I'm always able to say, hey, I'm wrong. And sometimes that I'm able to approach a subject with ignorance and and have an open mind, you know? Yeah. I, I, I like your piece on relying really heavily on this idea of science that maybe isn't something science actually ascribes to the sort of the scientism we've seen over yeah. the last few years that's sort of taken over a lot of a lot of thinking in place of where people maybe used to lean on philosophy now they've they've found this is sort of an inter interesting intersection of like monotheism and like programmer brain mm. that sort of i think leads you yeah. to thinking we're all living in a simulation but then also leads you to thinking that there's one perfect technical solution, and if we can only get that, yeah. that somehow our perfect system will be achieved, which is uh, v very much feels like we're going back to like 1890s philosophy. Yeah. No, no, you're you're right, and I think I think a science, uh, sorry, a, a programmer brain. I, I I like that actually. That's that's that idea that like oh well no this is the scientific truth. Or when I hear Bitcoiners or Ethereum, a lot of Ethereum community members now they're saying oh no no all the scientists agree that this is the best approach oh no this is a scientific truth how could you deny that layer two scaling is not the best approach you know that's that's and yeah. that's also the opposite of what good science is right good science should be able to question these things and also yes. you know interject but the interjecting of values that's where philosophy comes in right so for me a value is hey you know users shouldn't be exposed to admin keys what's science's opinion on that I don't think science has an opinion on that. <laughs> right. There's a value here. <laughs> like, why, why do we, why does science even care if people lose money? It, it, it doesn't, right? Y human beings care. Philosophy cares about that. So, yeah, I think, I think that's where we need to draw a certain line. And uh, that's, that's where we need to interject a little bit more of the humanities because, you know, blockchain is not just a scientific experiment. It's a social experiment. I think people and social experiments are living things and we need to look at that objectively because, you know, we're part of it, which adds a certain bias being in it ourselves, right? Historians in the future will be able to look back at this period with a lot more objectivity, but being part of it, we have to recognize that these are social experiments and we need to learn from them. And when they don't do what they're supposed to and we're unable to create course, we need to iterate and we need to go to the next one. And then we need to go to the next one until we get it right. And that's, I think, yeah. where we are. That's why, you know, I, I just, if Ethereum doesn't change course, it's going to be not the first biggest blockchain. It's not going to be the second biggest blockchain that's going to be dominant in the future. It's, it's going to be these alternative layer ones, in my view. Because if you don't give people that capacity, if you don't empower people, with scaling, then I think it's just, it's the whole exercise becomes an exercise in futility. And if you don't have decentralized governance, it's all just decentralized theater. And that's, that's not what I signed up for. Yeah. I hear you. Well, Justin, thank you so much for coming on Validated today. Thank you. This was a really good discussion. I really, uh, I really enjoy this. And, you know, you've, you've praised me a lot for, uh, for changing my mind and I'll take this opportunity just to praise you for so 
having the open mind to have me on here, even though I've said some things about Solana that were pretty harsh. I can reflect on that now. Um, and yeah, I really, I really appreciate that. And, and I'm yeah. just glad to speak to your community. And I, you know, I, I, I really want to promote the values of decentralization and I want, I want cryptocurrencies to succeed. That's, that's why I'm here to a large measure. And I don't, I don't care what free letter ticker achieves those goals. Ultimately, ultimately I'm a pluralist and, uh, and, and that's why, yeah, I'm here. So thank yeah, you so much. I respect that. Thank you.